I'm joined today by Prof. Glenda Gray. She's well known to all of us. Um, she's the president of the South African Medical Research Council, but she's really led the way recently as we've seen in the media and amongst our colleagues with the vaccination rollout program for, for, for South Africa. And um, it's such a wonderful thing for us as doctors to have her leading us and, and welcome, Brenda. Uh, Brenda. I want to thank you for your time. Um, I know things are beyond hectic for you at the moment. We thought that it would be very helpful as the Gauteng General Practic Practitioners Collaboration to be able to ask you just a few questions about the rollout, not, not, not really the political side, but more just the scientific side. And so, so that our doctors know what, you know, what, what are they enrolling for? and so that they can really lead the way in terms of, of, of setting the example that will hopefully be the first step in terms of the public being vaccinated. So thanks very much for being with me. Um, a, a few questions to start off with. I, I, on your Oxford trial that you, you did the arm for in South Africa, we, we, we saw a few things from my understanding. Um, we saw that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, showed quite a good efficacy in terms of preventing severe disease and COVID um, and a relatively good efficacy the way I saw it in terms of preventing COVID as a whole. Can you just very briefly tell us, you know, without get, us getting into any of the detail, like how, you know, how does the, is this a good vaccine? Okay, so um, we started the ensemble study, which is that phase three at 26 vaccine uh, trial. It's a single shot vaccine, so you only need it to, to do it once. And the idea was to create an emergency um, intervention, a single dose vaccine. And we wanted to ask whether a single dose vaccine could work uh, to prevent um, uh, COVID infection. So, so um, we, we rolled the study out um, at the time when a new variant in South Africa was emerging, which was called the 501 uh, V2 variant. And um, we were very concerned that this uh, variant may impact on, on efficacy because we were seeing evidence that, that um, there were decreased levels of neutralization um, uh, in, in response to this new, new variant. And we alerted um, the, the manufacturers about this and we started to collaborate with them to share samples to make sure that we could understand what was going on. We also asked them to, to um, accelerate the whole genome sequencing from our part of the world uh, so that we could understand the impact of this uh, new variant on our vaccine efficacy. So when we heard on the, at the end of January that the vaccine had, had, um, was showing efficacy, and uh, when we saw the data, uh, we could see that this vaccine, irrespective of region, uh, impacted on severe COVID, which is hospitalization and death. And um, most of the, the severe disease actually came from South Africa, because uh, we, we were enrolling at the time of the, of the, of the um, second wave. And so we were able to rapidly evaluate the vaccine um, and its impact in South Africa. And South Africa, obviously, um, uh, the, the most of the mortality and hospitalization came from our, from our region. So we were able to directly assess whether this vaccine worked um, in South Africa, given our severe um, epidemic at that stage. And the, the good news is that irrespective of region, um, this vaccine works against uh, severe and critical COVID-19, it works um, against hospitalization, it protects against hospitalization and death. And so the good news is that um, in South Africa, this vaccine showed um, tremendous efficacy in, in, in that, and uh, that encouraged us to, to try and accelerate access to healthcare workers. And so as you know, the vaccine is not registered in South Africa for commercial use, and um, it's not registered anywhere in the world. Um, the, the vaccine is going through emergency use authorization in the US, um, in Europe, and in South Africa. But as, as of yet, um, we are waiting for the um, EUA, which we think from the FDA will come very soon at the end of February. So we were, um, we were caught in the middle of, a, of a knowing a vaccine works and the time it takes to register a vaccine. And in this case, it's probably going to be about 12 weeks. And uh, asked the question, you know, could we get access could healthcare workers get access to this vaccine much quicker while we're waiting for the registration? Uh, so we approached J&J &J and there were available um, vaccines that we could use in South Africa while we waited for 
registration. And so um, because the vaccine is not registered anywhere and everyone's applying for emergency use authorization, um, the only way we could give early access to this vaccine to healthcare workers in South Africa is to do what we call a, a, a demonstration or implementation uh, project or implementation uh, protocol. And so what we, what we have is a, a phase three, what we call a phase three B, open label study. And, um, and this is essentially, it means it's not a placebo. People get the active vaccination and we, we, met, we vaccinate half a million healthcare workers to assess how this vaccine works on the ground in the field. And, um, and also, so there's kind of two benefits. There's the benefit to the individual, to the healthcare worker, and then there's the benefit to science, because if we can rapidly understand um, this vaccine in the field, you know, we can help with the rollout and scale up. And so this, this phase 3B vaccine uh, study or early access program, like we like to call it, um, will enable the healthcare worker to get the vaccine, um, but it'll also enable us to understand better how the vaccine, the side effects, the reactivenicity in, in the field um, amongst healthcare workers. And so we do know that um, when you get the vaccine, you know, you will get a headache, you'll have um, some mild flu-like illness, and that's for us an indication that the vaccine is working. Your immune response is kicking in, and, and that's important for us to know that that, that happens. And so the GPs may feel a little bit flu and, um, and um, after the injection and um, may feel you know, a little bit under the weather, but that's to be expected. And um, they can use Panada if they, if they want. Um, they can take Panada uh, before or after the vaccination to try and uh, mitigate the, the side effects if they have any. Thank you. You're answering a lot of my questions even before I get to them, which is excellent. So I much appreciate it. Um, so, so just a, a couple of things from a few questions being asked by the GPs. Um, wh why does it take such a long time for, for the vaccine, you know, once there's already been a trial like this to be registered? In other words, you know, can we expect it to soon be registered so that it can be rolled out, not in a trial setting, and where then it will be rolled out to the public? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, the regulatory processes have to be followed. So we're in a situation like um, we bought a new car and we don't have the number plates, but we have those um, uh, permits to drive it. Um, and it, it, so there's this period of time where you're waiting for your vaccine to be registered, um, but it works. And so um, you can either drive the car with the, um, with the permits or you can wait for your number plate to come. And uh, so we wanted to... Um, in accelerate access to healthcare workers, there was a hiatus uh, because of the AstraZeneca vaccine that, that wasn't um, that could not be rolled out as yet, and so um, we used this interim period to try and accelerate access to healthcare workers before the, the next wave. And so um, you know this is completely voluntary, so the, the GPs don't have to enroll; um, they can wait until the vaccine is uh, registered. So um, you can take it now under. A research conditions, um, or you can wait for 12 weeks or 14 weeks for a vaccine to be registered in the country. And so this is an interim period, and it's completely voluntary. It's optional, and um, it's it's an early access uh, to a vaccine that will be registered in our country, hopefully um, at the end of March or April. Okay. So um, you, you you obviously don't work for or specifically with J&J and &J. As, as the president of the South African Medical Research Council do you envisage that we will have similar projects that will come through in terms of Pfizer vaccines, Moderna vaccines and other equivalents and for people who have been following the research on those vaccines overseas and and, and want to hold out and then coupled with that question um, for, for the doctors who, who really had their eye on getting a Pfizer vaccine in the long, long run, um, do we have any information so far in terms of cross-vaccine um, suitability? Okay, so first of all, I need to say that um, the Pfizer vaccine was evaluated at a time when we just were looking at, in, in a time when we just had the wild type Wuhan strain and the virus hadn't evolved yet. So we're looking at vaccine efficacy uh, before the emergence of the variant. So we don't know um, yet how Pfizer will perform in South Africa. 
um, we need that data. So even though, even when Pfizer is, is registered in South Africa, we also would have to do some kind of work um, to see that what is the impact of the, the variant on, on, the, on, the, on the vaccine, whatever vaccine we bring into the country. And so even, you know, so there probably would be, as you roll out a vaccine, you probably have to do some background checks on the impact of the variant on the vaccine efficacy. And that's important because you don't want to roll out a vaccine uh, that doesn't work and you don't want to spend a lot of money. So um, even though, even though the, the vaccines may come, um, we will have to also evaluate uh, in side studies or, or parallel studies where it works. We are fortunate at this point in time that we know the j and A26 vaccine works because we rolled it out at the time of the variant in our country. And so we, we have that data and we can say with confidence that this vaccine performs you know, with the current strain. And, um, and we, need to, we need more data on Pfizer. Um, it's a very good vaccine. Moderna is a very good vaccine, you know, huge potency. And so um, we do think that, um, that, that it, there will be, an, there will be um, it will, it, we, we need to evaluate whether there's an impact of the variant in, in, our, in, the, in the vaccines that come along. So, um, you know, so, that, so basically we know that that's important for GPs to know is that um, the, all the vaccines we will have to always monitor in South Africa to make sure that the variant hasn't affected its ability to protect people. And in terms of, you know, putting, putting the mindset of the average GP, I mean, I, having listened to a lot of your presentations, uh, we understand, and I think this is an important point to stress for my colleagues, that these vaccines are safe. Um, the, the safety has been proven in terms of the J&J &J vaccine, um, and from your research, even the efficacy. But for those who, who would be in doubt, um, certainly there's no safety concern. The, if future research comes and shows that there is opportunity for Pfizer, Moderna, Sputnik, one of the other vaccines, you know, is there the ability to be able to be vaccinated a second time with another vaccine that works on a different technology, or, or, or is it a once committed, that's the program that the doctor goes on? No, so the good news is that you can um, take other vaccines. So we saw this in the USA. So a lot of healthcare workers volunteered to be in studies. And when the, the Pfizer or Moderna was rolled out, they um, unblinded themselves on the vaccine trials and they took the other vaccine. So uh, it's what we call a heterologous prime boost. So it can only get better because you basically um, stimulate your immune, immune response in a different way. And so you, you might get a bit more reactive on your second dose. Um, but we, you know, the, the healthcare workers in the United States who were on our trials, you know, did did also receive the Moderna or Pfizer in the rollout of the government in the US. So um, you can, you can mix and match and um, you can uh, decide to take another vaccine. It's always good to wait, uh, you know, you need to have, uh, the longer you wait between the first vaccine and the second vaccine is good because you get a better immune response. Um, the, the waiting period is important because um, the, immune, the immune response is much better if you if you wait a, a couple of, of, of weeks, you know, so I would try and wait, you know, more than 12 weeks between one vaccine and the next. Okay, we understand that the follow-up, I understand the follow-up was 28 days at the end of the, 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 the this vaccine initially. Uh, do we have, do we envisage that there will be booster vaccines as well that will be necessary as, as yeah, perhaps there are yeah. other variants that... Yeah. So there, there is another vaccine trial ongoing with the same product, with the A26, um, it's a, and it's a two-dose trial. And so we'll be able to compare the one-dose trial to the two-dose trial. And obviously, if the two-dose trial looks better, uh, we would also recommend um, that everyone who got a single shot uh, gets a booster shot um, at a later stage. So um, with, with the A26, um, and also um, if the if the um, you know, so obviously there's there's a scarcity of vaccines, and so we also need to give the vaccines to other people. So we should, you know, we should also make sure that that um, you know we wait we wait if we have had a single shot of a vaccine, um, we wait for others in the queue to get the vaccine before you know trying to um, get it before the general public. So you know we, we are fortunate to get this vaccine and. 
um, you, you can have options for other vaccines in the future, but I would suggest um, that we give the rest of the country a chance to get these before we take a second shot. Now, I know you have a very busy schedule, so I want to wrap up so that you can get onto your next commitment, but just, just a couple of last things. I'm ex very pertinent to this upcoming week for GPs, which may I take the opportunity of like really thanking you and the others who have been very instrumental in giving the frontline workers of, G of GPs the opportunity to do this, because I really believe in the speak of my own experience that we are seeing, we see COVID patients every day and we, it gives us both personal benefits and benefits to be able to contribute to the ongoing body of research. But um, exclusion criteria, um, a lot of questions from doctors, particularly pregnant women and breastfeeding women, are there any, um, to, and people who recently had COVID, are there any um, exclusion criteria for doctors who they shouldn't even enroll? Yeah. So obviously pregnant women, we shouldn't enroll. Is a trial ongoing, looking at the, the safety and efficacy of this vaccine in pregnant women. So that data will be out soon. So if I was, uh, we don't want pregnant women to enroll in this study. You can, you can enroll if you're breastfeeding, we don't mind that. And, um, and so if you do know you're pregnant, you know, you should wait for another option uh, for, for yourself. And, but if you are breastfeeding, we're happy. So that, and if you've had COVID, we also suggest you wait a little bit because you, you know, your immune system has responded to uh, COVID-19 and you're going to have, uh, you're going to have a, an immunization and you might get a lot of side effects because of the, the activation. So we would, we would suggest that you wait in around a month between um, having COVID and getting vaccinated.